putting democratic planning into practice. What was Project Cybersyn, and what does it have to do with the participatory economy? Find out in this episode of Pep Talk. Could you please tell us uh, what you see as the alternative? Welcome to Pep Talk, the participatory economy podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. I'm your host, Mitchell Strapanchik from Chicago. In this episode, we will discuss Project Cybersyn, the technology project in Chile in the early 1970s. I am joined by two guests. Uh, joining us from Boston, Massachusetts in the United States is Robin Hanel, and joining us from Helsinki, Finland is Antti Jai Huinen. Our topic is kind of obscure, but also kind of relevant to the work regarding a participatory economy, especially when it comes to computers and technology. Um, Project Cybersyn is its name, uh, spelled C-Y-B-E-R-S-Y-N. Um, not a lot of people know about this, um, so it bears taking some time now to explain it. Um, we'll be making reference throughout the, this episode of the podcast to a book that might be the most authoritative version of the book. I'm holding a copy now for the video podcast, but for the audio, I'm explaining the book is called Cybernetic Revolutionaries, Technology and Politics in Allende's Chile by Eden Medina, uh, published by MIT Press. The book was published in 2011. The reference is to a project that developed for about two years from 1971 to 1973 called Project Cybersyn, which we'll talk about more in a moment. But first to set the set, lay the setting out for what happened in Chile in the early 1970s. There had been an election and the, um, the people of Chile had elected an outright socialist government. Um, Salvador Allende was president. He was elected in 1970. Um, and there was a great fear among um, the powers related to the United States and allies that um, there was going to be yet another country that was going to go socialist in the early 1970s in um, the Western Hemisphere. And there, was, there were efforts by the United States to try to block that. Um, they ultimately succeeded in a coup in 1973 where the government of Allende was overthrown. Allende himself was killed. Um, the Project Cybersyn, not to spoil the ending here, was abandoned. Um, and uh, a dictatorship involving Augusto Pinochet basically held power in uh, Chile for the next 17 years. But talking more about uh, the project of Cy Project Cybersyn at play here, um, I'm going to actually read an excerpt from the book to set the setting for Project Cybersyn. Um, I'm going to be reading from page five of the book, Cybernetic Revolutionaries. Bringing Chile's most important industries under state control challenged the management capabilities of the Allende government. The rapid pace of nationalization added to these challenges, and as did the number of employees in the state-run enterprises, which was growing in concert with Allende's efforts to lower unemployment. Moreover, the government lacked sufficient numbers of qualified people to run the newly nationalized industries, and production was hindered by shortages of spare parts and raw materials. A small team of people in the Chilean government believed such problems could be addressed through the use of computer and communications technology and set out to create a new system for industrial management in collaboration with a group of British technologists. From 1971 to 1973, the transnational team worked on the creation of this new technological system, which they called Project Cybersyn in English or Proyecto Cinco in Spanish. The system they envisioned pushed the boundaries of what was possible in the early 1970s and addressed the difficult engineering problems such as real-time control, modeling the behavior of dynamic systems, and computer networking. More impressive, these, this, the team tackled these problems using Chile's limited technological resources and in the process pr proposed solutions that were different from those explored by other more industrialized nations. The system they proposed used new communications channels to transmit current production data to the government from the state-run factories. These data were fed into statistical software programs predict, designed to predict future factory performance and thus to enable the Chilean government to identify and head off crises before they came to pass. The system included a computerized economic simulator, which would give government policymakers uh, an opportunity to test their economic ideas before implementation. Finally, the proposed system called for the creation of a futuristic operations room 
where members of the government could convene, quickly grasp the state of the economy, and make rapid decisions informed by recent data. So in a nutshell, that was Project Cybersyn. Um, Robin and Hanti, what are your thoughts with regards to this, uh, what I've described regarding Cybersyn? Robin, let's start with you. Yeah, um, we should think a little bit about the political sort of background to this situation. Um, first of all, the Allende government was a coalition government. The leading party was the Socialist Party. Um, but there were several radical parties that were not the traditional or the old Socialist Party. And I believe the Communist Party was also part of the coalition. Um, and But the coalition as a whole um, had already come to the conclusion that they did not want to implement, they did not want to simply implement the kind of socialist planning that, you know, had been, that was being used in the Soviet Union, that had been, you know, that had been imposed on the governments in Eastern Europe, um, and very explicitly that Cuba had adopted. So when the Cuban revolutionaries came to power, um, and they realized, well, we now have a large part of our economy that's been nationalized, what are we going to do with it? They turned to the old Soviet model and essentially implemented, you know, a version of the Soviet model with Soviet planners helping them do it. But by the time the Allende government came to power, politically, those that coalition politically had self-consciously rejected wanting to do that. So they wanted to do something different. And they knew that the major reason and they wanted to do something different was they didn't think that sort of Soviet centrally planned system was sufficiently democratic. Um, and so I think that's the, those were the political, that's the political backdrop for inviting in, you know, some people from, 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 from Great Britain um, who were saying, look, there's now been a lot of advances in computer technologies, and we can use those advances in computer technologies to make the old centrally planned system a lot more democratic um, and also a lot more efficient. And I think that's the, that, that's the backdrop for what was going on in a very hectic, difficult situation that only lasted really a year and a half, you know, before it had to be abandoned in Chile. Auntie? Yeah, uh, I think it's definitely interesting in many ways. Uh, one of them is uh, that uh, I think uh, people in Chile were, uh, and I and the government were sort of uh, clear from the start that they don't want the kind of central planning that exists elsewhere and has obvious problems. Uh, and one of the uh, things that Project Cybersyn uh, tried to solve was how, for example, factories and for example, factories of iron and so on could work directly with ports or, or other factories to uh, find out the supply and demand for their you know, products. Um, because the government felt that running everything through the government was hugely inefficient and could also result in, uh, uh, in corruption. Uh, and th these are all from, from the Medina's book that uh, Mitch pointed out. Uh, but I think it's um, it's also it was way ahead of its time in many ways, and that's also interesting that it's uh, even the architecture was clearly influenced by Stanley Kubrick's movies, which apparently Stafford Beer was a fan of, um, and it, it had real this sort of sense of you know progress in a sense that this is the kind of economy we want in the future, and it, there was clear. Drive. I've uh, emailed shortly with Raul Espejo, uh, who was one of the uh, young engineers in that program at the time. Uh, and he has written how everyone was sort of energized and enthusiastic about building this alternative economy that isn't uh, centrally planned per se and isn't, capital isn't obviously capitalist, but instead allows workers and uh, consumers to plan, workers and citizens to plan out their activities. And I think that is definitely interesting for our podcast. 
Yeah, Auntie had mentioned the gentleman's name, Stafford Beer, who, um, unless you happen to know the history of cybersyn, you're probably not going to know unless you happen to know the history of the field of what's called cybernetics. Stafford Beer was one of those British technologists that is referenced in Eden, Medina, um, Eden Medina's book, um, who was very influential in the design and the de development um, of uh, Project Cybersyn during its time in Chile and its development in the maybe two years it was around. So that's the reference there. Now, let me let me throw one short thing in. I mean, sometimes when we look back on history, what, is, what occurs to me is, um, what would have happened if the Allende government had not been overthrown? Mm -hmm. So Cuba had come along and introduced socialism into you know into the Western Hemisphere. Um, they. I mean, the, the, the Cuban revolutionaries clearly had come to the conclusion that they didn't want a capitalist economy. They wanted a socialist economy. And, you know, in the early 1960s, um, the only model that was available to them, you know, that was out there that you could sort of grab onto was the Soviet model. And they went for it. And here is a second group of Latin American revolutionaries who come along a decade later. And they have clearly come to the conclusion that looking at everything that was going on in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and also in Cuba, that some sort of new model was needed. Some sort of socialism where the planning was more democratic and perhaps also more efficient because of new computer technology capabilities that had come along and were becoming available. Had the Allende government not been overthrown, I think it's not, I mean, I, I can easily imagine that they would have grappled with these issues just as we have continued to grapple with these issues for decades and decades since. And we would have had a lot more real world experience in sort of exploring how you can put democratic decision making on the part of workers and consumers more into play. You know, how do you go about vitalizing what was the old traditional central planning approach to capitalism? How do you transform it and where does it lead? And it's one of the great tragedies of history, not just the loss of human life and the brutality of an incredibly brutal fascist Pinochet government that, you know, that ruled in ruled brutally in Chile, killing many, many thousands um, in the process. The tragedy was not only that human tragedy, it was a real loss of an opportunity at a point in history where leftists and socialists were beginning to explore the kinds of things that we clearly need to explore more thoroughly. And, and, that, and that's a second tragedy of, of the demise of the Allende experiment. Yeah, and that kind of leads to, I guess, a related question about, um, this is the Participatory Economy podcast. Um, and we're talking about something that took place nearly 50 years ago that is to some degrees removed from it. Well, how are the two connected? It seems to me like they're connected because they were uh, trying to explore different ways of um, a different economic model. But what do you think? Auntie, let's start with you. Yeah, when I first heard of Project Cybersyn, I, I immediately thought that this is highly relevant uh, because uh, like I'm, I'm from Finland. I'm from a Nordic welfare state, and I feel that for any future economy, the lessons from Nordic welfare states will be hugely important to learn what has gone right here and has what has gone wrong, um, and to use those tools. But similarly, it's somehow easy for me when reading the history of the third, uh, the so-called third world. Uh, it's easy for me to imagine a world where some of these revolutions are. Uh, uh, in third world countries that aim to create, when when compared to example what Nor Norway did with its soil, a lot of the countries uh, in third world, uh, what they tried to do was much less extreme than what us Nordic countries did with our economy. Um, and the aims of those third world countries were sort of more uh, moderate, I think, than what Nordic welfare states have done. Uh, when compared to vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, state ownership or uh, national planning and so on, which are huge in all the Nordic states, also in Finland. Um, and it's easy for me to imagine a world where these revolutions in, in the Southern Hemisphere wouldn't have failed 
wouldn't have encountered such a heavy resistance uh, uh, funded by uh, U.S. Uh, you know, uh, oil or direct U.S. involvement, or uh, wouldn't have suffered from the kind of corruption uh, and um, uh, sort of dictatorship, political dictatorship that Soviet Union tried to impose on a lot of these countries. Uh, and instead, I think, and I think Malcolm X has referenced this as well, it was basically welfare states that these countries were aiming for, and they weren't allowed to. They were, you know, bombed to the ground for even trying. Um, and we might have very valuable lessons uh, for use in today if these countries were allowed to experiment with different kind of systems for welfare states. Uh, and Chile took a even sort of bit forward with that because uh, what the Cybersyn project was about, I think it really was a sort of a, a it's called leapfrog moment, uh, that they tried to do something that was, I think, maybe even, you know, 100 years ahead of its time. Uh, I hope less than 100 years. Uh, but the, direct, uh, the relation to participatory economy definitely comes from the fact that many of the goals in that sort of very crude uh, system were similar to what participatory uh, economy tries to uh, achieve. Albeit, of course, I might say the participatory economy is, is much more sort of uh, developed with more care and developed with more sort of nuance and you know, reality with, with what we need in a real economy. Uh, but on the other hand, participatory economy has been developed in a relatively long time, in a relatively, you know, peaceful environment, whereas uh, the engineers in Chile and the whole situation in Chile in the early 70s was just in immensely hectic because they had to fight against the capitalists or un United States imperialist forces. Uh, but also, I think they had to fight against a lot of misconceptions about central planning, they had to fight against, you know, a lot of people probably being very sort of worried that why are, you know, why is the IND government spending time on this? Why aren't they just commanding the economy like everyone else, for example, Cuba? So um, I think it's it's very important to research this because uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of these experiments to research. And Project Cybersyn was in many ways very advanced version of this. Uh, Robin, same question to you. And since you co-invented the model of a participatory economy, how does a participatory economy connect to Project Cybersyn? Well, I mean, I think Project Cybersyn was, that project addressed two sort of fundamental issues. One was a clear recognition that there was something wrong with the centrally planned economic systems that were the real world you know, that existed in the real world. So it was a clear rejection. And, and, and on the grounds that what was wrong was the economic decision-making processes were simply not democratic enough. They didn't afford citizens adequate opportunity to participate fully in making those economic decisions. I mean, another thing that at the time was very important was amongst leftists, one of the reactions you know, one of the responses to, you know, the, the non-democratic aspects of centrally planned economies was, well, it's not the economic system that's wrong. It's the political system. It's the single party dictatorship. And if you take a look, you know, Allende's Chile was the first time in Latin America that you had a left movement saying, we are not trying to impose a single party political system. You know, we want to retain multi-party po politics and we want to retain some sort of democratic political situation system in which those multi-parties are competing with one another in elections. So it was a clear rejection of traditional socialism as it was known in two fundamental ways. And then the third thing that was coming into play was the whole rise of new Techno new information technologies and computer, can computer capabilities. Now, I want to contrast. I mean, the Internet did not really come about for another 20 or 30 years. So there was kind of a second technological revolution that had not even, you know, that, that wasn't even on people's horizons in the, in the early 1970s. 
And, and that is another thing. So just as in that period, people were struggling with how do you make economic decision making more democratic and how does this new computer technologies that we have in the early 1970s help us do this? We now have sort of the same thing going on. People are asking, how can you make participation in decision making, economic decision making more democratic, um, more participatory, more meaningful so that people will actually want to get involved because it actually means something to them? Um, and how and what is the relationship of new information technologies, in particular now the internet revolution? You know, what opportunities does that afford that were not technologically available in times past? And participatory economics, I think, is part of what we've done is attempt to learn from all that and sort of propose answers to what it is that the new technology does mean and what it doesn't mean. What does it allow you to do that you couldn't do as quickly or efficiently before, but what fundamental things does the existence of the new technology really not change, um, you know, in terms of how it is that we're going to have to go about things? Uh, to be fair, with regards to the history of the internet, it turns out that the very incipient work regarding the internet almost coincided exactly with the time when Project Cyberson was in most active development. The very first email that was developed, that was sent out was in 1969. Project Cyberson got off the ground in 1971 and was in more or less active development for about two years. So it just, there, there, is, there is some overlap, but also to be fair, yes, the internet wound up getting another 50 years of development after that where Project Cybersyn didn't. And in fact, that's actually the next question I'll actually um, raise with regards to uh, Project Cybersyn for Robin and Auntie. What happened to Project Cybersyn? My read of it, and the book alludes to this, is that, as I had mentioned previously, um, there, there was a coup, power to no small extent, by the United States government and allies um, to overthrow the government uh, uh, kill Allende, uh, impose a new regime that was far more friendly to um, capitalist interests. And as part of that, with Project Cybersyn as part of that, was either uh, abandoned or just demolished. So it just read to me like it was just killed on the vine in the wake of this coup. If the coup hadn't happened, maybe it could have still developed. But that seems to be to be what, what happened. Uh, Robin, Auntie, what's your take? No, uh, that, that's clearly the case, um, and we can put a name on it. It was the Nixon government, and the architect of the coup, the, the, the mastermind of the coup, was Henry Kissinger, mm -hmm. who was, you know, was Richard Nixon's secretary of state, and Kissinger had identified Allende's government, you know, as, as, as a danger to U.S. hegemony, you know, in the, in the, in the Western Hemisphere. He said, we've got Cuba here and we're doing everything we can to eliminate Cuba. And the last thing we want to do is to allow a second sort of government that the US doesn't control to come to power. Um, and that's a well-known history. I mean, that I mean, you could dispute that and pretend that that's not what happened, you know, at the time it was occurring, but you know, Sometimes we learn, sometimes 40 years afterwards, we get true history. And anybody who reads the true history of exactly what went on, that was Henry Kissinger was the brainchild of overthrowing what he considered to be a very dangerous experiment that the United States could simply not tolerate in the 20, in, 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 in our hemisphere. Um, and, it, and it just brought to a, it brutally brought to a close this incredibly interesting experiment you know, on the part of leftists and socialists to somehow go beyond our own mistakes of the past in terms of single party governments um, and in terms of central planning, which is authoritarian and allows far, far too little, um, you know, political participation on the part of workers and their enterprises and actually consumers also as well. Auntie, what's your take regarding what happened to Cyberson? You agree? Yeah, um, well, I agree. This was a, a great reminder from the peace movement of the 60s and 70s from Robin. Never forget Henry Kissinger. Uh, 
as of recording this podcast, he's still alive, by the way. Yes, but, amazingly <laughs> still alive. <laughs> yeah, um, still commenting on Ukraine and whatnot. Uh, but the other thing that happened, I think, to Project Cybersyn is is sort of a bit more positive one, uh, because a lot of the research that went into Project Cybersyn slowly uh, seeped into the internet culture and internet design that was like Mitch said like that was being formed during the 70s and many of the Chilean uh, engineers those who managed to escape executions uh, uh, made sort of lucrative careers in cybernetics and computer I- industry IBM hired some of them and so on and they they really you know put their skills because they had really advanced experience practical experience of the kind of systems that wouldn't be built in a long time. Also, I think Medina mentions in, in her book uh, that uh, what social democratic governments in, in Scandinavia uh, d- later in the 70s and early 80s started to uh, experiment with ways uh, of coordinating uh, union activities and u- uh, coordinating decision making within workplaces with unions and so on. And that work also, uh, I think it was actually called participatory design or something like that, um, is is something that was also influenced by the experiences from cybers. And I think it definitely sent ripples throughout, uh, maybe not so much through socialist networks, unfortunately, maybe socialist networks also. I think Paul Cockshut, uh, uh, Cockshut and Cottrell uh, both have referenced cybers in some fashion. But I think uh, otherwise, computer industry and co- those design elements and so on uh, sort of paid a close attention to what was happening in Chile. And those engineers that managed to escape spoke very favorably about what they had managed to achieve in extraordinary uh, conditions. Uh, so I think for the cyber scene, even though it was really harshly destroyed, like, I mean, the uh, planning rooms and everything were completely burnt down and destroyed uh, by the new government. Um, so Pinochet definitely didn't want, want that work to uh, persevere. Um, but somehow I think it did. And I, I think it's a testament to that, that a lot of modern writers and modern designers, the cybernetics community, uh, writers such as Evgeny Morozov and so on, uh, keep referencing cyber in more and more because of its importance to finding democratic ways of planning the economy. Um, This kind of leads with regards to the point that Antti just raised regarding technology. Um, And me, because I've worked professionally in software development for 22 years, um, I was particularly interested in this project and how it had developed, but also seeing about where I look at how it was developed. Um, I'm, I'm both fascinated and horrified at the same time. Fascinated because it was like, wow, they're able to do this with what technology they had, but also because I've used technologies that are way more advanced than what they had, I was kind of horrified. But to be fair, you know, it was the early 1970s. The entire country of Chile had maybe 50 computers, 50 mostly mainframe computers, mostly bought and used by the Chilean government. Um, And... That's, I mean, that's basically what they had or what anyone would be able to have for use if you wanted to use a machine to do computing technologies. That's what they would have. And yeah, they were, that was what you would get. The actual interconnectivity, especially with modern internet networking, where internet technologies are now super easy and um, available and there are a whole lot to choose from. At the time, there was only really one, and it wasn't even the internet. It was actually the combination of telegrams and telephone wires that are known as telexes. I had actually never even heard of the term telex until I had read in Medina's book on the topic. I had to look it up. Telexes were the communications infrastructure. right Around the time, the internet was just in its very infancy being developed, but there it wasn't using telegram technologies, it was using computer signals to be able to send transmissions of what are referred to as packets, um, a small signal that's being sent from one computer to another through a telephone line. In what they did in Project Cybersyn, it was telexes, telegram messages that were sent from um, one one 
one machine to another, what basically amounted to one telegraph receiving machine to another telegraph machine receiving machine um, from a telephone line. And that was their communications backbone. We, we, once that information was received, it was then aggregated by mainframe computers and brought together. So in a nutshell, that's basically what they built. And it was, yeah, an incipient version of what now is very widespread and commonplace, but which was very beginning. And yeah, if it had continued on with development, um, it could have exceeded what would have happened or perhaps augmented on it. We don't know and we never will. Yeah. But Robin, Auntie, what are your takes with regards to the technology? We'll start with Robin. Oh, sorry, uh, Auntie, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, the interesting thing for me is just to imagine what it was like. And there are there are descriptions of this, I think, in Menon's book. Mm -hmm. That at that time, and Chile is a country that's very hard to traverse. So it's there's mountains. Right. It's very difficult to get from one place to another. But they managed to make the uh, you know test versions where factories in different parts of the country could you know in the morning send with you know simple inputs that this is what we're going to produce today. And then in the afternoon, they could input that this is what we actually loaded into the trucks and they're now headed your way. Mm -hmm. and, and the other factory could receive this, you know, almost in real time that they could check in the morning. Okay, this is what they're going to produce. This is what we need to prepare for in, in the evening or next morning when the trucks come in. And then they would even get confirmation in the afternoon that this is what's coming up. And the factories could do this, you know, between themselves. And I know it doesn't sound, you know, fancy nowadays. <laughs> Uh, but for me, it's easy to imagine it, it must have been pretty revolutionary at the time, and especially in a socialist context, where it's usually, you know, commissars just, you know, commanding stuff and you, you're you being, you know, disallowed to communicate with other factories instead just rely on, on bureaucrats telling you that this is what's going to happen. This is what we need you to do. Uh, so I think it's even at that crude stage, the possibility of, factories communicating directly with one another and doing it in almost real time is just mind blowing. So Robin, what's your take on the tech? Okay, you know, I'm gonna do something a little strange. I'm gonna take a giant step back and take the view from space here. Even though it's sort of, at the end of a podcast, you like to wrap things up in a nice bow. And what I'm really, I think, going to do is sort of say, oh, my gosh, there's a whole open set of questions here that we haven't even touched on. Um, so let me start with this. So we have proposed a way that an economy could run called a participatory economy. And we now have explained it in sort of great detail. Could a country in 1895 have implemented our proposal? My answer is yes. No computers, I don't think, I mean, the, we don't have a computer in 1895. So in some sense, we've made a proposal that doesn't rely on computers. It doesn't rely on an internet or any sort of modern communication technology. Well, what's the relationship then of modern technology to an economy that a country could have adopted and it would have been a wonderful economy in 1895? Well, clearly the technology is not necessary if we're right. That doesn't mean it's not helpful. That doesn't mean that it doesn't allow for information sharing that is more rapid and efficient for all sorts of decision-making procedures. And that's the way I would sort of, I view the technological revolution as essentially making a desirable economy even more efficient and smoothly operating um, rather than well, without the technology, you can't have a desirable economy. But now that we have the technology, we can. So I, I want to throw that out there. And the other thing I want to throw out there is, well, wait a minute. You guys now have a wonderful chapter, largely thanks to Mitchell, you know, in democratic economic planning, where you've done all these simulations. And, you know, these are computer simulations of the annual planning procedure. Now, Here's the thing I want to point out. To carry on the planning procedure doesn't require, the, the simulations are an attempt to answer a very particular question, which is if we can simulate the actual planning procedure, can we do that as an attempt to find out how many iterations and how long would it take? 
to answer the question, is it actually practical? But the computer simulations have actually nothing to do with what the planning procedure would be in a real world economy. Yep. They are part of what's going on in the planning proposal we're making. Um, although the information technology and the ability to share information quickly and to summarize and access information quickly, that clearly makes the actual real world process of what we proposed something that is far more smoothly operating and quickly and efficiently operating. So I just wanted to throw all that out there in terms of what's exactly related to what in terms of what we're talking about here. Yeah, and you're right to be agnostic with regards to the technology. It, the, Project Cyberson worked with what they had. You know, in 2022, we would work with what we've got now. There's a lot more tools and a lot greater availability, lower cost and so on. But yeah, you work with what you have to try to build what you can. Um, and on that note, um, we come near to the end of the podcast. Uh, any final lessons or thoughts here? Auntie, we'll start with you. Uh, I will have to say, because Robin, out of the box, Hanel, uh, threw, that <laughs> wench, threw that wench here. Uh, I, I just have to say, I, I was about to you know, uh, promote this book, which is interesting, The People's Republic of Walmart, which handles okay. uh, sort of real world planned economies, which are huge companies. And that's an interesting topic for another time. But mm -hmm. because Robin started to talk about space, I will have to take a step back and to, uh, make a shout out to fans of William Morris and Guild Socialists out there. And, you know, we need positive visions for the future. But what about this? That uh, could we have, you know, visions of participatory economy in the medieval times? Because <laughs> that actually could work. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> and, and that's that's an out of the box idea for you. That what? How would you know? past societies work if they were allowed to use participatory economy. Mm. So here's a thought out there for the end of the episode. <laughs> Robin? Well, and, and, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned William Morris and guild socialism. And, and that's essentially what I, that, I mean, that, that's very similar to what I was trying to raise in people's minds. 1890. Um, <laughs> Could you have had a desirable economy like the kind of participatory economy that we are talking about or that that William Morris was proposing and writing about at that time? Mm -hmm. Or is that was was that whole vision premature because the information technology and computer capabilities were not available at that time? And my answer is no, no, no. We could have done it then. People could have done it then. The information technology is helpful, but not necessary. It's, it, it's, it, it's, we need it's an episode necessary. on that. We need an episode on that. <laughs> That's right. That's we need right. a book on that. <laughs> you have been watching and or listening to Pep Talk, the participatory economy podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. In this episode, we've been talking about Project Cybersyn, the technology project in Chile in the 1970s. To find out more about the participatory economy um, project, you can visit the particip econ participatory economy website at participatoryeconomy.org. There you can find um, articles and uh, all of the episodes of this podcast, Pep Talk, uh, as well as an online forum where you can join in on discussions about Project Cybersyn or participatory economy or topics related to any of the above. Um, there's also a, a regular newsletter that is sent out. You can sign up there with your email address um, uh, online. From uh, Chicago, I am Mitchell. Uh, on behalf of Auntie in Helsinki and Robin in Boston, thank you very much for watching or listening. Goodbye. Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? Self-management, democratic control of communities or workplaces, federal arrangements. Participatory democratic planning. Jobs down a mix of empowered your nesting councils linked to one another. Everyone gets to participate in a project that they Please visit participatoryeconomy.org to find out more and subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, and see you at the next episode.